Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of CSP 105 Insiders Outside, hosted today by none other than myself, Jason Gay, and the man himself, James Trent. I am a transfer sophomore here in Ann Arbor, majoring in film production, and I'm from San Jose, California. Hey, glad to be here with you today, Jason. My name is James Tran, and I'm a transfer student from Lansing, Michigan. I'm a political science major with a minor in public policy. Great to have you here today, James. And today we will be discussing uncomfortable interactions with implicit biases and how it's affected us. But first, implicit biases are unconscious stereotypes we make about a topic or person that we aren't aware of the ignorance or negativity in what we just said. Everyone has their own implicit biases about topics and they might not even realize they had a biased opinion. In the TED Talk, How to Outsmart Your Own Unconscious Bias by author, speaker, and CEO, Valerie Alexander, she says, when we stop and examine our own behavior, we can catch ourselves having different reactions to expectations of people simply because they don't look like us. Before we get caught saying a negative implicit bias about something, we need to learn to take a second to really process what we are about to say and question if that comment would hurt someone's feelings or not. So let's get into it today and y'all will hear us talk about a time we've been hurt or impacted by someone else's negative implicit bias and a time that we've been caught in our own negative implicit bias and how it's affected someone else. So James, can you tell us when there was a bias that affected you negatively? Yeah, first and foremost, thank you for that great summary of implicit biases and what we've been learning recently. Uh, implicit bias that have neg negatively affected me, I can even trace back to a couple weeks ago or just since March. Uh, everyone knows with the coronavirus, there's been a lot of Asian American uh, prejudice that's been happening and occurring throughout the uh, nation. They let that be from verbal, uh, physical violence, or just general structure set up to you know, kind of reinforce this belief that it's an Asian virus. Uh, and that could be coming from President Trump calling the Kung flu, so on and so forth. Uh, and to be completely honest, before I went to UMich, uh, I was working at Home Depot over the summer. And it just like a cesspool for that type of hatred and uh, ignorance casted upon uh, minorities. And the store didn't really do much to break down those barriers. Uh, so when just constantly when I'm working, uh, there's people that will completely avoid my lanes. They will completely avoid my service. They will completely avoid my existence. And oftentimes that's just terrible, terrible feeling, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a mindset that it reinforces these beliefs that there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my people, you know? Yeah. And it kind of casts this over like shadow of a doubt over my head and it, creates this feeling of, am I worthy of being amongst other people? And that's something that uh, the readings talked about uh, in the beginning, you know, is if you do not allow people to speak through their own self-determination, how much of someone can you really say that you know? That I've been kind of constantly affected by this like negative implicit uh, bias uh, that's been honed by the society that we live in recently. Um, now that goes back to you. What about you, Jason? Uh, have you had times where you've been negatively affected by a bias and how did you uh, kind of deal with it? Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and yes, there is, uh, back in elementary school, I think it was fifth grade. I was playing kickball with my friends during recess, but there was this one kid who played with us. that was a bully and he picked on me from time to time during school. He called me the N-word over a disagreement we had about a call in the game, and it was a stupid argument in a game. And I was really surprised he called me that, honestly, because I was, because that was like the first time someone has said that towards me in a negative, towards me negatively before. But was there ever a time you yourself acted out in implicit bias that potentially hurt or impacted somebody else, James? Great question. Um, I think a lot, a big focal point of this class is uh, humility. Uh, and as we talked last week, uh, grit, it's kind of just constantly facing the truth. And uh, I'm ashamed to admit I have. And it's, I feel like it's almost natural for a lot of human beings to, to do so. You know, a lot of our mind files are, uh, as Professor Naylor would say, is corrupted. Um, yeah. And, and we kind of act up on upon those. Uh, growing up from Lansing, it's a predominantly black community. Uh, all my friends from elementary school to high school were black. Um, and back then it was almost normal for people to say the N word, just 
even if you weren't black, even if yeah. you never felt the struggles of what the N word represents, like histories, years and decades and centuries of the mutilation of the black community. Uh, and I used to recklessly say, it. you know, I had the confirmation from my friends, like it's, it's a genuine issue that I feel like as we were younger, we didn't know the, the depth it had. And as we grew up, and definitely like in the latter half of high school, being junior and senior, that's when people started to be more open about their disconcern or their concerns actually with saying, uh, with non-Black saying the N-word. Um, and, you know, it might not seem like a significant thing because the people I were saying it around were not offended. But if I were to grow up and become a working professional and my colleagues, my managers, my people above me, below me, no matter what. If I'm saying that, what does it say about me? Yeah. It says that I'm unwilling, I'm unaccepting, and ungrateful of the stories and the tales that come from the Black community. It's a long history of a lot of hurt, damage, prejudice, and racism. So it's I'm ashamed to admit that, but that's something I've always hold dearly because it's something that I need to realize that I had to separate from. I cannot say that I'm a man or I'm doing something as childish and as negative as that. And Definitely. that's kind of my answer to that. And you being a mixed uh, African-American and uh, white, uh, how did, like you, you probably felt dealt with that too, you know, oh, yeah, so that line being drawn for you specifically. Yeah, definitely. So the question for you is the same. Have you ever acted on an implicit bias? Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, there actually has been a time that I've acted out on an implicit bias. Unfortunately, there wasn't a time about my own race being uh, biracial, but it was about uh, a different scenario. Uh, this happened recently. Uh, this happened, unfortunately, recently. And I took what happened to heart and I realized I still needed to work on some unconscious biases of myself. I was hanging out with my friends back in California and we were just watching TV, talking and laughing. And me and my me and my friends were discussing something and I said, that's gay. And I said that to one of my other friends in the room who happened to be gay and he heard the comment that I made. The second the words came out of my mouth, I saw he heard and I knew I messed up and I instantly felt awful for saying it. He wasn't upset and, I, and he was understanding about it, but which I was very grateful for. But I knew what I said was not an okay comment to make and was derogatory. This was a realization point for me because even though I had a friend who was gay that I regularly hung out with, I was still using the term gay to negatively describe something. And that is a hurtful way to describe something. And I need to work on my own biases still because I need to still be evolving, just like the reading said. Thoughts and words wrap up the show here today. Thank you all for coming out here and listening. There's a particularly long quote that I found in module four readings that I wanted to read and bring light on. In the module, it says, an unresponsive math or language teacher, a beloved father, mother, or friend who denounces a culture, genre, or music is all that it takes to open a biased field, file, or worse, encourage biased actions. The longer we practice this bias, the more entrenched it becomes in our subjective vision, and ultimately, it becomes our truth. We are now acting on the prolonged historical predisposition to not allow others to self-determine their value. For example, to require ourselves to establish sufficient experiences to see the other on their terms, aka this is status quo for majority of human history, end quote. Over the hundreds of years of human history, stereotypes become embedded in our subjective perspective by teachers or loved ones who are essentially required to shape children's cognitive thinking and how they view the world. A cycle of stereotypes and implicit biases form and now their subjective thinking and we are creating less culturally competent people. In order to stop implicit biases and stereotypes, the change needs to be in how we teach and prevent our ch parent our children. Teaching them about different cultures and how to be respectful to everyone regardless of their background will remove implicit biases in this world and create a society of acceptance and cultural competence. I want everyone listening to realize that you, us, are the you, us, are the change to remove negative stereotypes and it starts with your own thinking and how you view stereotypes or implicit biases in your life and what you can do to change them. James, do you have any cozy thoughts for us today? Yeah, it was an honor to definitely speak with you. Uh, yeah, you. See the perspective of another uh, man, uh, someone from a different background in race and ethnicity. We are at this premiere time with all the resources we have in the world to create the change that we always seek 
and you know, and I think we should really embrace that. And it's gonna be an everlasting fight. This isn't something we can fix in a day, a month, or a year. It's gonna be a life, I mean, a fight for the lifetime. Uh, so culture competency, object, objectivity, that's something we should strive and fight for. Uh, and we should figure out now how to start, how to enact it, and how to really push it into the society we want to be. Um, other than that, those are my final words. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, of course. Uh, it was a great time, there. man. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank our authors and sources for Module 4, Valerie Alexander, and thank you guys so much. Thank you for coming. We hope to see you guys soon. And yeah, goodbye.